Good morning, everybody. Happy 4th of July weekend to you. Welcome everybody in here. Welcome everybody watching out there somewhere. Maybe you're on vacation lakeside this morning. Uh, where if, you, if so, we're glad you took the time to join us. If you have a Bible this morning, wherever you are, would you turn to Esther chapter 5, please? Esther chapter 5 this morning. As we continue the series, Esther versus Haman. In our summer showdown series, Esther versus Haman, we saw a little context to where we are to catch us up this morning. We saw that Esther has been chosen to replace Queen Vashti. She has been removed from her post, and Esther has been installed as the queen. Esther is of Jewish descent, and she is a direct relative of the man Mordecai. The king has brought forward his number one man. His name is Haman. Haman does everything the king wants. He makes the king's life easy. And so the king continues to empower Haman to give him his authority, to give him his stamp of approval. Haman is an egomaniac. He is a pride-filled man with a fragile ego. And he wants to go through town, and every time he comes through town, he wants people to pay homage. He wants them to either stand or bow or kneel or to gesture in some way that he's the best. One day he was coming through town, and Mordecai didn't give him any gesture of respect. Haman being filled with rage, he was filled with rage, he put out letters to all the provinces in the kingdom that all the Jews, any relative or uh, genetic relation to Mordecai, all the people that are of Jewish descent in the land will be wiped out by executive order from the king. Sought permission from the king, and he got it. Problem is, he didn't realize that Esther, the queen, is one of them. And so Mordecai, passing messages between he and Esther, his, Esther's assistant, he would give a letter or a message and it would go to the queen, and he has told Esther, you are the only one who can go in on behalf of us people. You are the only one who can go in and intercede on our behalf and save our very lives. And she says, well, there is a custom in the land. There is a custom in the kingdom that nobody, including me, the queen, can go in and approach the king without being invited. So if I go in, I may be sentenced to death. And we know this king doesn't have a problem removing a queen because he just did it and put Esther in her place. So she knows there's a great risk, and he says, look, even if you don't, even if you keep it a secret and stay silent, it'll still fall on your head, so you might as well go in there. So Esther says, okay, we're going to take three days of fasting. I'm going to go in. I'm going to talk to the king. And she says, if I perish, I perish. And so the fasting is completed. We come to the third day. Esther chapter 5 and verse 1. Here we go. It came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. She comes into this inner court in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. So she comes and opposite to the door that she enters, uninvited, not supposed to do this. She puts on her royal garb and she presents herself and she opens the door and she comes in. And she stands opposite where the king is sitting in the throne room. Verse 2, when the king saw Esther, Esther the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. The king looks with favor. He's happy to see her. He's happy that she is there. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther came near, touched the top of the scepter. Remember... If he didn't do that, she, she's at peril of her life. So she comes in, and she has to wait for the scepter. So she comes in, and he goes like this. Then she comes forward. She touches the top of the golden scepter. 
The gesture is a gesture of acceptance. Oh, man. So now is the moment. Why are you here? Why have you come uninvited? Why have you done this? What must be on your heart to have run such a risk? I think about the Lord. I think about Jesus. I think about how in this story, God's people, they were under the oppression of Haman. They were under the death sentence of a madman. All people in the world, all people are under the death sentence of sin, having no ability to redeem ourselves, no ability to escape what was upon our heads. The people in this story, they have no ability to approach the king on their own. They can't get in there. They couldn't even get into the royal court, the outside court. If they came to the king's gate and they tried to enter uninvited and tried to open the door, go in with some horses and chariots that were passing by and run in behind them, they would have been pulled aside and killed instantly as foreign invaders. Get out. They have no ability to enter on their own accord, no matter how much money, no matter how many good deeds, no matter how many friends they have, no matter what they've done, they cannot come in. Someone has to go on their behalf. The Bible says of us, unable to redeem ourselves, no matter how many good works we do, no matter how much money we give, no matter how much religious ritual we observe, we are unable to redeem ourselves before a holy God. We are unable to approach the throne of glory on our own merit. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Esther is a picture of this very thing. She is coming in and risking her own life to save the lives of the people. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 9 that Christ entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. This is the picture we see. He extends the royal scepter. I accept you. I accept you. Come Come on in. What is your petition? The Bible says of Jesus. Psalm 110. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. What a picture this is of a mediator on behalf of the people. Esther was the only one that could go in, and she comes in. The king accepts her. Verse 3. Then the king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? He knows this is peculiar what has happened here. This is way out of the ordinary. Something must be pressing upon her. What is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be given to you. What do you want, Queen Esther? Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman... Come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, he tells some messenger. He snaps his fingers, maybe. He said, Hey, go, somebody go get Haman. Bring Haman quickly that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Verse 6. As they drank their wine at the banquet, the king, the second time, he said to Esther, What is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. He said, I'll I'll do it. It's okay. He knows. He knows something's up. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be done. I don't know if you can feel it or not. Like, do you, do you, when you read the Bible, what's, what's, you know, the the scripture says in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is living and active. It's alive. And if you let it, just settle on your heart for a moment. Sometimes you, I feel like you can feel the story. You can feel that tension. You can feel the fog in the air. Esther has come in. You can feel her holding her breath, standing at the door, looking at the king. You see the people in the room turn in your mind. You can feel people like, what's going on here? They look to the king. The king sent the scepter. She comes. The banquet is there, and now there are three people there. And they all are having a little bit different experience. Haman, we see a lot of his character in this story. We see a lot of what's in his heart. We see a lot of the type of man that he is. So for Haman's experience being invited to this, he's pumped. He loves being invited to this special dinner 
with only Esther and the king. And she says, oh, and bring Haman. So someone comes and gets Haman. Haman's going about the king's business somewhere. Someone comes running in. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. They know it's a messenger of the king. What, what, what is going on? Why are you interrupting? The king, the king needs you. The king needs me. He loves being called by the king. Because in part, he thinks he's a king in his own right. He loves it. And he's like, what, the king needs me? What is the king? When does he need me? He needs you right now. Why? The queen has requested a special banquet, and there's only two people invited. The king is one of them, and you, sir, are the other. Oh, of course I am. Of course I am. I'm Haman. I'm Haman. That's what a Haman thinks, that they always are entitled to an invitation, that everybody loves them the best, that if there's anything important happening, they're going to be invited to be there. So he loves it. If only he would heed the counsel of the scripture from the blessed Lord Jesus, who said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. And so you see that. You see him exalting himself, and you see Esther humbling herself. So Esther's at the dinner. Well, Haman's loving it. Oh, you know, more meat, you know, like more wine. Like, ah, he's just looking around, you know, he's happy to be, he's talking with the king, he's listening. Like, oh man, he's looking, he's looking at the other parts of the table. There's no one else sitting there except for him. He's happy to be there. Then you have Esther's experience. You can almost feel a tension in the air. The frog in your throat. Esther, you, you had this big banquet. You, know, you have to, like, does the Bible say all this? No, but come on. Like, they, like just, just go with me, all right? Is that all you're going to eat? I'm not really that hungry. You know? You can feel the tension. You can feel, like, when do you go for it? When do you go? The real reason I'm here is because he wants to kill everybody. Me? My surrogate father, this guy has hatched a plot and deceived you. When do you tell the king, who's a little bit of a maniac too, sir, you have been duped. You have been played the fool. By who? Slams the table. By him. When do you do that? It's uninvited already. So he, he, by his gracious mercy, he has allowed you to even do this in the first place. When do you say this is about you being deceived? So you feel the tension. You feel like the awkward quietness in the air. And you can feel it because the king is suspicious. He knows there's something else. Surely, Esther did not risk her life to ask me to dinner tonight. Surely, she did not break protocol in front of everybody for a banquet. There was another way we could have done this. So he knows. You see it twice. Verse 2. 3. Then the king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? He knows. There's something under the surface. What is going on that you have done this? What is troubling you, Queen Esther? There must be a heavy burden. There must be a weight on your heart. What is your request? You want to ask me something. I can tell. He brings it up again. Verse 6, as they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. He's trying to reassure her to draw it out of her. I'll do it. What do you, what do you want? You, what do you want? Like half the kingdom or something? What is it, some crazy request? So what, what is your petition? I'll do it. What is your request? Even to half the kingdom. Something's there and he knows it. Verse 7. So Esther replied, my petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do what I request, and you're waiting for it, is she going to say it? And she doesn't say it. May the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. I'll tell you what it is. So he, he sets it up. He tees up the ball right there. And he goes, just tell me. Obviously, you have something to ask me. This is crazy what's happening. Obviously, there's something I can see on your face. I can hear it in your voice. I can feel it in the air. Just tell me. And she, you know, does she take a breath? Does she like, ah, okay, here it is. I'm going to tell you. I will. 
could I do it tomorrow? Would you come tomorrow? If I prepare this all again tomorrow, would you guys come back tomorrow? And I'll tell you tomorrow what, why I've done this. Like, tomorrow? Like, you're there. It's right there. It's right there. Say it. Why doesn't she say it? She so said, come back tomorrow. And the answer is, we don't know why she didn't say it. So you just have to feel it. it but, but who wouldn't have done it? Like some of us would have done it. We would have sat there. I don't know if this is Esther's reason, okay? I don't want to put something there that isn't there. But what is there is a delay. And there was a reason for it. We don't know the whole reason. Part of it might have been what it would have been for you. Ah! <laughs> like it just would have been. Is she nervous? Did something not feel right? Did she, did she read the vibe in the air? Was there something about it where she just wasn't comfortable letting it go just yet, pressing the button? Like, so I don't know. Was she looking for something? A confirmation maybe. Doesn't say that. But you got to wonder, was she looking for one more thing for God to go, do it. I got your back. Do it. I don't know. But she's going to get that. Whether she was looking for that or not, I do not know. But that's what she's going to get by waiting. She's going to get God saying to her in a special way, I got you. I got you and I got your people. Say it. I think about times that, uh, and maybe there's somebody here. You look for confirmation sometimes, even though God has said it. You know, she's decided already. She said it. If I perish, I perish. I think God might have set this up. Mordecai says, he said, who knows that maybe you haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows if God wasn't working way back and put you in the throne right now, right here for this reason. Of course he did. And she does believe it too. She says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast for three days. You guys do it with me. And then I'm going to go in there and I'll ask. And if I perish, if I die, so be it. She believes that God has set this up in some way. And many times you believe the same thing. That God orchestrated your life. He lined up details. And you go way back, you're like, no way. And you didn't know what things meant when they were going on. You didn't know the reasons for things. And your life got pushed this way, down this path, by things you couldn't control. And you're like, huh. And you were praying and you were fasting maybe the same way. The Lord answered or the, the, your, your life just you took another direction. And the Lord takes you down a path and you end up right here and you're like, wow, God was working something the whole time. And I think he wants me to do this. He wants me to go here. And even as sure as you are in that moment, there does come a time once in a while when you go, could I just have one more little sign of confirmation you wouldn't be the first one to ask. We, we go back to a classic story. There are more than this one, but the classic is Gideon, right? Uh, if you've never read this story, it's in Judges chapter 6. If you want to read it later today, good uh, 4th of July weekend reading. Uh, you, could read, you could read that. He also is, is chosen of the Lord to be a deliverer for God's people out of an oppression that they could not deliver themselves from. Same thing. He is the Christ figure in the story too. It's important to always read the scripture through the lens of the gospel. W ask yourself this question when you read anything in the Bible, even way back in the Old Testament, where is the gospel story here? And you will see it. You will see the deliverer. You will see the Christ figure. You will see the people held captive, unable to release themselves, and somebody comes in by the power of God, endorsed by the Lord to deliver them. You will see it leading all the way to Jesus. So you have Gideon. The Lord comes. He's the youngest in his father's house. He's the poorest family in Manasseh. He's a nobody from nowhere. The Lord comes and he says, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior, angel of the Lord. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. I got you. You're going to deliver God's people from the Midianites. And he's like, what? He calls on you. And you're like, huh? I'm picking you to do this. I'm asking you to do this. You know, sometimes people come to me, oh, Pastor, man, the Lord put this thing in front of me the other day, and I'm, I was talking to this guy, I was talking to this lady, and they had all these questions, and then they said they want to meet with me again, and uh, they want to go to a restaurant, and they want to get the Bible out, and they got all these questions, and I'm not equipped to answer these questions. Would you come with me? Most of the time, I'm like, nah, <laughs> because, because he picked you. Amen. 
He picked you. If he picked me, then he would have set it up for me. If you want help, you want to talk about it in advance, you want to pray with me, that's cool. I hate to break it to you. Not really. He picked you. You are the choice. You are God's choice for the moment. Go. Go. And trust the Lord when you do it. And so then you do what? You're like, oh, if it's really supposed to be me, just give me one more little sign. So, so Gideon, he does it. He's like, if it's really me, Lord, and he does the thing. He puts the little fleece rug out, and he goes, uh, okay, here's a fleece of wool. He's like, all right, Lord, if you really pick me. He knew he did, but sometimes you need a little more just to help your heart. And it's okay. We're weak sometimes, and the Lord knows who he chose. Get the fleece of wool out, and he goes, uh, all right, if you really pick me, when I wake up in the morning, I want to see the dew from heaven, you know, from the sky. It gets wet at night. You put the dew from heaven on the fleece, but on the ground, make it dry. And that's how I'll know. He goes to bed, comes out in the morning, he's like, darn it. No, probably not. <laughs> probably not. But it's because it's exactly what he prayed for. He's like, Ah, oh, and, and it's wet on the fleece and dry on the floor. And that's a little bit of confirmation. So what does he do? He goes, can we do it one more time? Just one more time. Maybe I made that up. Maybe it always happens that way. Maybe, I, maybe, it, all, maybe it wasn't God. So he goes, he's like, okay, this time, this time, make it wet on the ground and dry on the fleece. And then I'll know that I know that I know. And he goes to bed. He comes out. It's just like that. Gideon goes and the Lord does it. Listen, it's okay. Sometimes you need a signpost from God in your life. I don't know if that's all that Esther's looking for or not. I don't know why she delayed that second day. But I'll tell you what, if it would have been me, if it would have been some of you, you'd have, said, you'd have gotten there and you'd have been like, here's the moment. You go, just give me a second. Let's do it tomorrow. And you pray to God in the night, Lord, if it's really supposed to go this way, if I'm really supposed to put it on the line. Remember years ago, I w there had been a lot of stories like this. Um, you, know, you walk with the Lord, you ask God to help you, he helps you. My truck had all these problems, and uh, I got mad one day driving home from work, and I pulled in. I said, yeah, I'm going to buy a new truck. I'm tired of this. My truck was being weird. I, I just pulled into the first car dealership on the road. I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy a truck right now. Pulled in, got in the mood. I walked in, can I help you? Yeah, I want to buy a truck. This truck doesn't work well anymore. And they're like, like today? I'm like, today. And uh, he said, well, well, which one? I'm like, I mean, that white one over there looks great. Can I drive it first? He's like, yeah, yeah, you can drive it. And he goes and gets the key. He's like, you know, this is a real story, I promise you. And, and he, go, he goes over, gets the key, and he, uh, he goes, all right, well, I'll, we'll take you for a ride. Can I get a copy of your driver's license? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go for a ride. I'm like, oh, cool, man, I'll take it. And he goes, all right, well, we got to work some financing out. And it's, it's, it was like, you know, I was coming home from work. He's like, the banks are closed. I can't, I can't, I can't get it all done today. Can you come back? And I said, yeah, I'll come back. And I went home, and I felt it. I cooled off a little bit. And I'm like, man, I don't know, you know. Maybe I'll pray to God first. Pray to the Lord. Lord, if I'm supposed to do this, I don't want to be a financial idiot. You know, it's like, can I, I don't want to mess my house up and, you know, do everything, you know. If, if I'm supposed to buy it, I'm going to go back there and just make everything work out. And then it was like the weekend or something, so a couple days went by. And I went back. I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm going to buy that truck. And so I went back to that dealership. It was out of business. I know. It was gone. Like, out of business. All the cars were gone. It was over. This was like one week later. Not even. It was like not even a week. I pulled in. I'm like, oh, the truck. My truck got weird again. So I pulled. I'm like, oh, I got to go buy that truck. Gone. Sometimes he'll make the fleece wet or dry, depending on what you want to do. I don't know what she was looking for, but maybe you and your life are looking for something. You're like, man, I know God called me to do this, but I'm scared of it. And I feel inadequate to do it. Ask the Lord to help you. Give it a minute. Come back tomorrow and go, okay, Lord, if it's really you, just show me something that I know that I'll recognize crystal clear. If God is God, watch him be God in your life then. So whatever the reason was, King goes, all right. They all go home. Verse 9. And Haman went out that day glad and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Here we are again. He comes out, he's like, man, I was the only one at that dinner. Man, I'm important. 
He comes out and people start standing, you know, they're like, he's like, I was just at a dinner with the king and the queen. No one else was there. You weren't there. You know, they're, they're standing and he, look, he looks again. This isn't the first time. He looks again. Oh, they're at Mordecai. Verse 10, Haman controlled himself, however, went to his house, sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches. See, a Haman, an egomaniac like this, loves to regale people with their greatness. So first, he gets all his yes men around. These aren't real friends. A Haman has no accountability in his life or her life. A a Haman will not hear truth that is good for their character. A Haman will not respond to conviction. A Haman will not place somebody in their life as a check to their crazy. They will not do it. They run those people, those real people, out of their lives. People that actually care about them. People that actually love them and will actually invest in them. Actually challenge them. Those people get all weeded out and replaced with happy yes men that no matter what a Haman comes up with, they say, great idea, great idea, man. Whatever you want, buddy, as long as I can be your friend. And that's what he's got. So he gets them all around verse 11. Recounted them the glory of his riches. Man, you know how rich I am. This guy doesn't stand up for me. The number of his sons. It's like 10. Later on it says he has 10 sons. You know how many sons I got? You know the legacy I got? My name is going to go throughout this kingdom for 100 years. Every instance where the king had magnified him. You know what the king gives me? You know how much he trusts me, counts on me? How he had promoted him above the princes and the servants of the king? I'm higher than a prince in this kingdom. I speak and they do what I say. And yet this guy, Haman also said, verse 12, Even Esther the queen, you know how important I am? Even Esther the queen let no one but me, that's right, come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. Yes, sir, you are. You're the honored guest, in fact. He said, yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. He said, no matter how great I become, every time I see that guy, it just robs me of my joy of looking in the mirror. That's what he's saying. So they have an idea. And that's what he wants. He wants it. He wants it fixed. You guys, what do you think I ought to do about this Mordecai? I, I mean, we're we're gonna we're gonna. I sent the letter. We're gonna kill everybody. But this guy, it's not. Man, this guy's driving me crazy. And even if we kill him, it's almost like it's not a big enough statement. Like someone will just come with a sword and kill the guy. And I won't get the satisfaction I'm looking for. I want something bigger. Verse 14. Zeresh, his wife, all his friends said to him, we have an idea. Have a gallows from which you hang people. Fifty cubits high made. And in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. Issues a fast man. Okay, okay. I'm going to go to that banquet tomorrow. And I'm not going to see this Mordecai guy not paying me homage. I'm going to take care of it between now and then. Somebody build a gallows 50 cubits high. Okay, I know we don't measure in cubits, so I had to look it up. It's about... 75 feet high. Okay, so how high is 75 feet high, right? Okay, the peak of this building right there, lots of fun, from the, from the cement floor to the peak of the building is 35 feet. So more than twice that high. I mean, Mordecai's not that tall, but what is this really about? It's about a statement. It's about a spectacle. 
He's making it the biggest thing in town because he wants to make the biggest statement in town. What is the statement? This is what happens to people who do not bow down to me when I come through town. Tell me that there's nobody else who won't pay me the respect that I believe I deserve. You see what happened to Mordecai. He's going to hang 75 feet high so everybody can see it. But first he's got to get permission from the king. He's got to get an execution order. And that's the advice that his wife and all his friends gave. So he's got to go because tomorrow is the banquet. So he hurries over there. He's going to hurry over there. He's going to come in because Haman can go anywhere he wants in this kingdom. He's going to burst in late at night. The banquet's over, the dinner's over, he's gone home, Mordecai didn't stand, he's all mad, has this conversation with his wife and his friends, and now the hour's getting late. He needs an execution order by morning. So he's going to run back over there. He goes back over. Hate to wake the king up, problem is, the king's already awake. And Mordecai's already on the king's mind too. Isn't that something? Well, let's bow for prayer this morning, everybody. I know, I'm so sorry. I'm not. That's so much fun. Oh, man. Let's bow for prayer for a moment this morning. Maybe you're at a place in your life you just need a little confirmation. So thankful we serve a gracious God who leads and guides and directs, and channels our hearts and orchestrates our steps. The Bible says many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. It's okay to ask God to direct your steps, bring assurance and confirmation in your life, to be sure that you heard what you thought you heard. That's okay. Maybe you just need to ask the Lord today, Lord, I'm pretty sure I know what you're asking of me. I'm pretty sure I know where and what you've called me to do. But God, please be patient with me. Please be kind to me. Could you give me just a little more so I can be sure? Something I'll recognize. Something that'll leave no doubt. Help me, God. I pray this all the time, I gotta tell you. I need the Lord to help me all the time because sometimes I have a feeble and doubtful heart. Sometimes the voices, whether it be spiritual or the voices of people, creep in on me. And I just need to know one more time, God, you said this, right? Like you called me here, right? Please be patient with me, Lord. Make the fleece wet and then make it dry. It's okay, go ahead. Talk to the Lord. Lay it before the Lord. Take some time with God this morning.